friends welcome to the lecture series on technology society and politics today's lecture is an analysis of the impacts of two important events in the history of man industrial revolution and fourth industrial revolution so this one we have discussed the timeline various events that shaped both the industrial revolution and the fourth industrial revolution or the second machine age the so last day we talked about the second machine age or say fourth industrial revolution and friends but we should know or we should understand what impacts that humans have to bear up with the technological revolutions that appeared since the 18th century that still continues in the 21st century so friends this lecture is an answer to that question that concern so the title of this lecture is Olduvai Gorge to Karman Line How Machines Ruined Human Society Olduvai Gorge to the Karman Line How Machines Ruined Human Society So it's an argument that I am presenting before you that uh, the question of whether technology emancipated man or not This lecture will tell you that technology did not emancipate man rather technology enslaved man so friends it was in the in the 1960s in the 1960s a kenyan british archaeologist and his wife mary leakey louis leakey the kenyan british archaeologist and his wife mary leakey who visited Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. Upon hearing a news that a new fossil, fossil wa was discovered, they were captivated by the news and moved to Tanzania in the 1960s to analyze the fossil. The fossil had a larger brain and body, as I have already told you in one of my earlier lectures, but smaller teeth compared to the earlier genus called Australopithecus. Louis Leakey and Mary Leakey discovered something very interesting in the fossil. So that was in the 1960s. That the fossils was a maker of a simple stone tool. That they proposed a hypothesis that this fossil might have used an older one stone tool older one stone tool and they called this fossil as homo habilis homo habilis otherwise called handyman and in the year 1981 uh, some other research team who again visited Olduvai Gorge 
in Tanzania, who discovered some other fossils in the place, which according to them had got certain cut marks in the fossils, in the bones. And the researchers testified that these cut marks were created by fossils of humans analyzed by Louis Leakey and Mary Leakey some years ago, particularly, specifically in the year 1964. So friends, these cut marks by stone tools on the bones discovered in the Old Uai Gorge in Tanzania made paleoanthropologists propose certain hypotheses. They propose that before the Homo sapiens, in our planet, there was an another hominid called handyman lived or Homo habilis lived. And they lived between 2.4 to 1.5 million years ago. And technically, we call them Homo habilis. So why do we call Homo habilis a handyman or why do we call them so? It's an interesting question. Friends, we call them so because these hominids might have used tools. This is our assumptions. This is our uh, hypothesis, a learned hypothesis that these Hominids might have used tools. So with this proposition, we can assume that humans are known by the tools they use or the technique they use. And then again comes the question, why Homo habilis might have used tools? The answer may be, this is also a hypothesis. It may be because unlike their ancestors, that is the ancestors of Homo habilis, such as Ardipithecus and Oslopithecus, Ardipithecus and Oslopithecus, their fingers had in strength their fingers had in the strength to peel off animal skin or break bones or cut animal meat. So the current evidences point to the fact that making tools help Homo habilis survive in the planet. So friends, Old Y Gorge in Tanzania is an important junction in human history. It's a very important junction in human history. The gorge enables us make a bigger hypothesis about our antiquity. that our ancestors might have used tools to relieve muscles, hand muscles. Specifically, we can hypothesize that tools helped our early ancestors relieve an important human organ from functioning. That organ is fingers. 
as tools improved our ancestors were captivated by the relief given to fingers from gathering food so they might have invented or created stone tool wood tool shell tool or bone tool so these were probably probably these were the materials the homo habilis might have used for creating tools thereby they can relieve their fingers from activity and friends <clears throat> ever since ever since <clears throat> technology improved technology improved we can see that hand tools improved also by the passing of time and you see the list of hand tools expanded which included but not confined only to wrenches pliers cutters files striking tools hammerald tools screw drivers vices clamps snips saws drills knives so many hand tools and our ancestors continued the habit of making tools so that muscles can be relieved from activity fingers can be relieved from activity hands can be relieved from activity so friends in the due course the passing of time it can be hypothesized that bows and arrows were built so hands were again relieved from activity so findings suggest that boats existed even prehistoric times so raft and canoe were the earliest types of boats so raft and canoe we can hypothesize that might have helped our early ancestors from using hand muscles for swimming so invention of bows arrows boats suggest that historically we were no we means our our ancestors were it's a hypothesis friends our ancestors were in a hurry to relieve our hands and fingers from activities so our ancestors in the due course of time tamed animals for travel for transportation so of course domestication of animals were a technical achievement so horses bullock carts etc were used since antiquity and body muscles were relieved thereby from activities so animal transportation was invented so that an important organ was relieved from activity what is it human legs human legs man is known for his bipedal skill friends man is called man because he is bipedal man is called homo sapiens the wise man because he is why he is bipedal he is able to walk on two feet and his two hands are free and again he has invented tools to further make his hands free from activity 
his hands are already free because only his legs are working for walking purposes and now with the discovery of animal transportation our bipedal skill is also removed from us that our legs uh, is now relaxed from activity so friends the discovery of animal transportation has taken away that unique bipedal skill from man and from humanity and from his essence the famous american writer louis mumford analyzed this prehistoric situation in his famous two volume book titled the myth of technology and he famously said in that book if man was indeed a tool maker he possessed at the beginning at the beginning an all purpose tool an all purpose tool right from the antiquity that louis mumford is arguing in his book the myth of technology that is a two volume book friends he was arguing man right from the beginning might have possessed an important tool an all purpose tool his own mind activated body his body itself is a tool so that is what mumford analyzed from the evidences he had collected from fossil remnants and other sources so what mumford said was that our body and mind was superior our body and mind was superior but since early time you know we have over stressed tools rather than our body and mind thereby mumford is arguing that man has succumbed his body to tools man has succumbed his body to tools and between 15th and 19th century between a long period of between a long period between 15th and 19th century a new world was opened and this new world was different from the terrestrial world the terrestrial world means the world in which everything is being connected the natural world the terrestrial world and this new terrestrial world was also paralleled by an another world called the mechanical world so we have a terrestrial world on the one side and a mechanical world on the other side so this happened appeared in between 15th and 19th century and this mechanical world was create, created by explorers adventurers soldiers administrators scientists technicians the state so this joined the forces these elements joined the forces with the scientific and technical new world and this new world was in fact shaped by scientists inventors and the engineers and this new world the mechanical world paralleled with the terrestrial world the terrestrial world is the world uh, that we inherited from the antiquity and friends our terrestrial and mechanical world has been falsely colored by the opaque religious prejudices the opaque religious prejudices of the 18th century enlightenment the 18th century tried to convince man that man has a natural reason 
thereby enlightenment detached man from his terrestrial world or his natural setting and assigned us the enlightenment has assigned us an all powerful conquering reason and enlightenment told us that you can conquer nature with that reason thereby we have created a mechanical world by the invasion on nature and we are told in the modern world in the industrial world that in the mining industry for example water in the deep mining pit water in the deep mining pit was lifted using hand power at the pit head but man required efficient technology because our hand was in that sufficient for lifting the huge volume of water from the mining pit so animal power was used but that was also proved insufficient hence we would find that the modern world discovered two types of engines the new common engine and the watt engine so mechanism the, the mechanization of activities started ever since the watt engine that our hand muscles was so much relieved from engaging in activities with the mechanization started with the famous watt engines <clears throat> and friends in the year 1885 a german craftsman karl benz who was the uh, who was arguably the first inventor of car automobile and again in 1804 richard trevithick invented steam locomotive and george stephenson in the year 1814 invented railroad locomotives called bletcher is railroad locomotive was called bletcher b l u c h e r friends with these inventions one important human organ was replaced from an important natural function walking bipedality so bipedal skill was already replaced by animal transportation in the antiquity and the subsequent invention of automobiles made us more sedentary creatures so we loved being in a state of no activity so muscles of legs aren't active with the invention of automobiles So later two american aviation pioneers called orwell wright and wilbur wright on december 17 1903 invented built and flew the world's first successful airplane friends their invention was landmark in human attempt to replace legs from active usage so invention of airplane has brought about a paradigm shift in human involvement in activities speed the idea of speed attained a new dimension in human transportation so what carl benz richard trevithick george stephenson and right brothers have revolutionized our world by inventions their inventions replaced our hands and our legs from active usage the attempt to replace the natural body organs from use from active use was further awaiting more inventions in the later age so we were in uh, in a perpetual waiting 
that we wanted all our human bodies relieved from active usage so that's why what carl benz richard travatic george stephenson right brothers are icons for us because they helped us uh, relieve our human organs from active usage since 2000 friends Honda revealed a humanoid project named Asimo A S I M O Asimo Asimo was a bipedal humanoid robot which can run walk communicate with the humans recognize your faces environment even recognize your voice and posture and interact with its environment so these are all uh, not you know uh, body skills these are all cognitive skills so recognition voice recognition you know communication uh, uh, recognition of face these are not you know done by human body organs rather these are done by Uh, cognitive abilities that's by brain so uh, ability of our brain and friends in uh, on october 25 2017 at the future investment summit in riyadh a robot called sofia was displayed and sofia was granted citizenship in saudi arabia and sofia became i don't know the gender maybe male or female i don't know whether robots got gender but we can call sofia as a female and she got saudi arabian uh, citizenship because sofia is normally a name of a woman that's why i called she not he so it has become the first robot in the history of mankind to attain a national citizenship and friends Asimo and Sofia pointed towards one important fact in human history humans are more and more interested in replacing ourselves with bipedal humanoid machines and at what cost was all these important you know you know inventions remained a big question to answer so friends it can be assumed that we can relax and enjoy luxury because of these inventions with asimo and sofia now we are compelled to introspect into ourselves are we going to replace ourselves so curious enough a question curious enough so the human world is witnessing a second machine age which i have told you in the previous lecture so the mechanical revolution enabled human muscles to be in a state of relaxation so it is a time now it is a time machines are able to take over thinking power learning power memory power and emotional skills these are all associated with the brain the development of brain and we call these cognitive skills and this is not a skill of human body which are already been conquered by machines by the first machine age and now we have certain skills other than our body skills that is called you know cognitive skills and we don't know where it is located in our human body but we say it is mind uh, its brain and there are, these are you know activities only humans can perform that you know learning or thinking or memory or emotion so only human body cannot uh, you know you know uh, exhibit this you know you know activities only human brain can you know display these activities that you know thinking it's a skill of brain learning a skill of brain memory a skill of brain emotion a skill of brain and we call these cognitive skills 
and only humans have this skill and not the bo human body perform these skills but the brain perform these skills friends but we started replacing these skills it started as i told you in the last class when ibm's deep blue computer defeated gary kasparov the famous chess player in a chess match in the year 1997 with new technologies under invention so friends an important human ability is going to be in in a state of relaxation it is the brain so in 1950 alan turing published a paper in which he speculated about the possibility of creating thinking machines that was in the year 1950 those days world was in much aware about what does it mean to say a thinking machine because that idea was in born then it was alan turing who proposed this idea and his uh, you know idea of a thinking you know he was saying that the idea of thinking is difficult to define we can't define what is what is meant by thinking of brain but he was saying that we can identify that human ability to think by a technique called turing test you you deploy turing test with the use of turing test you can identify that something is thinking and friends if you uh, if you use this analogy in the natural setting we can create machines which is said to be thinking according to turing test humans are thinking according to turing te test as well as we can also create machines which can also pass the turing test friends the turing test was the first serious proposal in the philosophy of artificial brain later we call it as artificial intelligence not artificial brain artificial intelligence so we call the attempt to replace human brain as artificial intelligence or simply ai artificial intelligence short form ai but the field of ai was informally founded till 1956 alan turing proposed this idea in 1950 but the idea of ai was informally inaugurated until 1956 at a conference at dartmouth chick college dartmouth college in new hanover new hampshire where the term artificial intelligence was coined so the word co was coined in 1956 friends since 2011 the world has been witnessing three important technologies deep learning big data and artificial general intelligence artificial general intelligence not simply artificial intelligence artificial general in intelligence since 2011 so friends now you have sensors and lenses which are ai enabled which is going to be future technologies so camera technology and video technology are evolving with the combination of synthetic biology and digital technology we are thinking of creating or inventing an artificial eye an artificial eye that can replace our biological eye friends we are going to replace our eye biological eye and we don't need our biological eye because science is thinking that we can create better eyes you look at the direction which science is moving so the human eye owes its wide field of view and high resolution eye search because of a specific thing called retina and a synthetic eye could perceive much higher resolution than a human eye it is believed so when artificial eye become a reality and when computer get inserted into your eye we don't need eyes at all biological eyes at all and our biological eyes will be removed right from your birth and in place you will 
you will have lenses inserted which have higher resolution than your uh, resolution being powered by the retina so sensors are a breakthrough breakthrough because it helps it helps you for image recognition robotics and artificial intelligence so both sensors and lenses are breakthrough technologies that will replace not only human eyes that's important point that you know sensors and lenses are going to replace not only your eyes it is going to replace man from so many work areas security this atm counter so many uh, places cashier billing uh, these kinds of things will be replaced by this artificial eye because everything is being uh, live recorded and stored because cameras got recognition ability it is able to recognize natural things so friends when ibm introduced its first speech recognition machine in 1962 ibm introduced its first speech recognition machine in 1962 only very few people could imagine that myriad myriad and myriad potential applications are awaited of this technology and speech recognition is now is a bigger area of artificial intelligence today speech to text translation is very possible speech to text translation is very possible many mobile devices incorporate speech recognition and most of you might have mobiles uh, which is you know you know uh, speech recognition enabled so apple siri is a voice command controlled personal assistant amazon alexa is a voice controlled personal assistant google assistant is a voice assistant so the investment so the invention the invention of speech recognition technology or devices have relieved us from an important human activity speech now friends speech and writing because machines can speak now machines can recognize speech and machines can write so you don't need to use your fingers to write you don't need to use your mouth for uh, speech because machines will do that so we are already you know relieved from writing and speech because of inventions of machines so image recognition technologies can identify places logos people objects buildings and several variables so applications such as google lens flow tap tap see are examples of image recognition softwares with these inventions friends precise human brain ability for recognition of objects place people writing and actions can be replaced look at the way in which technology is you know evolving all of a sudden friend something happened in the in the july of 2021 this month there was a famous tweet by richard branson you can log on to his twitter and find it he had tweeted from zero gravity to all your kids to all you kids he was tweeted like this he was tweeting like this to all you kids down there to all you kids down there at richard branson's message from zero gravity that was his tweet and he tweeted uh, the tweet by richard branson of virgin galactic on july 11 2021 by this he became 
the first person to ride into space the first private citizen the first private citizen to ride into space aboard a rocket he had helped fund two decades ago so he went to space by his own vehicle that's an important accomplishment as far as human civilization is concerned so he was accompanied by three other crew members so the maximum height maximum height uh, that his vehicle achieved was 90 km that is 55 miles and after this he updated his Twitter profile with a word, an important word in human history, Astronaut 001. So he was saying himself, Astronaut 001. So private, private citizen. So friends, on July 2021, again, Jeff Bezos of Amazon has become the second billionaire to reach the edge of the space with the three crew members. On the maiden flight of Blue Origin's New Shepard launch vehicle. And he did so aboard a rocket built by a company that he has launched in the year 2000. Friends, New Shepard's suborbital flight was designed to take the crew past the Kármán lines. So Carmen line was a word I have used in the title from old Y to Carmen line. So his suborbital flight was designed to take the crew past the Carmen line. And Carmen line was an internationally recognized boundary of space. And it is located, it's an imaginary line. It's also a hypothesis that there's a line. It's also a hypothesis, just like we did in the old Y gorge. So it's a hypothesis that there's a boundary in the space at nearly 3,30,000 feet above, roughly 62 miles above the earth atmosphere. First, with this, Jeff Bezos and his blue origin got an edge over the Spaceship 2 of Virgin Galactic owned by Richard Branson because he went just below 50 miles. So scientific community are now debating whether Branson was an astronaut because he uh, flew just below, well below the Kármán line. And friends, space is the fi final frontier in uh, final frontier of our world. Man since antiquity always looked up, and he was always thinking, "What is the secret there? And where is the space exactly?" And most people generally agree that most people generally agree that space begins where Earth atmosphere ends. Earth atmosphere ends. But answer to where is it exactly depends on who you ask. So international law states that outer space, outer space shall be free for exploration for all of us because outer space is the wealth of humanity. It's not a wealth of NASA or uh, ISRO or a European Space Agency or Chinese. It is the wealth of humanity. It belongs to all of us. So you, the US military has a different definition. And international space agencies have different space agencies have different definitions. But Carmen line is a most commonly agreed line. So a common definition of space is known as the Kármán line. It's an imaginary boundary located 100 kilometers or 62 miles 
above the mean C, mean C level. So it's a, just a hypothesis, friends. Uh, it's just a hypothesis as we did in the case of old Y Gorge in Tanzania that our early ancestors have used tools because we don't have any evidence. We are just hypothesizing that uh, early humans might have used, you know, uh, tools just like that. You know, carbon line is a hypothesis that there is a line in the atmosphere of Earth uh, beyond which there is no gravity. So it's a zero gravity area. It's a hypothesis. So friends, with all these, you know, uh, commercial space journeys, a new hypothesis was born. What is it? Humans can conquer space by sheer capital and money power. But the point is that neither Bezos nor Branson were schooled in astrophysics. People who are technicians in pure classical terminology are now able to do things that were otherwise impossible in the antiquity. Earlier, these were the domain of only trained people, only technicians, a domain of the scientist. Now you see people who are who have no connection with astrophysics are able to go into space so money can buy secrets of nature so our attempt to understand nature nature through space research reached a new height with the launch of blue origin virgin galactic and space x of elon musk a new industry was born, the space tourism. It's also part of the industrial civilization, a part of the second mission age. So there were debates. What is the utility of space mission now? Whether we need space missions? Some argue that it is clear example of waste of time and human energy. At the same time, some others argue that it is man's next level of evolution as a civilization or man's next tech level. So our general conclusion is that, friends, our search for whether aliens existed reached a new stage by now. Whether there are elements other than human elements in the whole universe. So many scientists feel that the money spent on manned space flight would be better spent on unmanned missions. So the unmanned missions is cheaper. It is safe, safer because no lives are at risk if it breaks up. But the question is, why do we enter into these types of science driven activities? Do we need to go there? The point is that we are placing science against ourselves, technology against ourselves, scientific knowledge against ourselves. But friends, do you think that the scientists should be blamed for wars? What about Albert Einstein? He looked for the fundamental truth in the nature and proposed a formula, which later became the source of atomic bomb. Can you blame him? What about Alexander Graham Bell, who invented telephone during the industrial civilization revolution? So military orders that kill thousands of people, innocent people are transmitted over his telephone. Can you blame him? Why not blame the bus driver who takes war workers to their factories? How about movie actors who sign for the USO? USO is an organization, non-profit charity who perform for American armed forces and the armed forces kill innocent people. Can you blame USO staff? Strange, right? So these comments 
may sound Philistine today. These types of arguments uh, sound Philistine today. But friends, in 1962, the chemist and sociologist Michael uh, Polanyi, Michael Polanyi, argued in an influential essay called The Republic of Science that the practical results of pure science are often unforeseen. Therefore, a scientist may not be liable for the crimes of science. So in a book titled Astrofuturism, another writer, David Douglas Kilogar, David, David Douglas Kilogar, in a book titled Astrofuturism. He used the word astrofuturism against the vanity that, the human vanity that. Science and technology have little to do with political, economic or social issues. This is a typical academic argument. This is a typical academic argument. So people like, you know, Bijusar is arguing, uh, talking against science. This is certain kind of lip service, uh, which has nothing to do with reality. See, people like me are often arguing against science. This is a vanity, an academic vanity. That is what David Douglas Kilogar says in Astrofuturism. In his book, again, Dark Side of the Moon, author Wayne Biddle, author Wayne Biddle, The Dark Side of the Moon, he defended pure scientists and argued that most crimes committed by science cannot be attributed to the discoveries of the scientist. Scientists are innocent. So, but friends, it's a fact that from old Y Gorge to the Carmen line, human world is stirred up by several assumptions and hypotheses. We think that humans are the better creature, but are we really able to understand that all the scientific achievements we made are really scientific achievements. Is it worth noticing? Or are we placing science against ourselves? Or are we placing science against humanity? Are we placing science against our own soul, our own essence? So you see, notice, friends, we have removed hands from usage, legs from usage, speech from usage, eye from usage, and finally brain from usage. Where are we moving towards? Of course, the answer is escaping from us. Sure, we can forget the answer. We can again and again invent more and more technologies. So the writer Louis Mumford, in his two volume book, Myth of Technology, says that, <clears throat> Our predecessors mistakenly coupled, mistakenly coupled their particular mode of mechanical progress. They have mistakenly coupled their particular mode of mechanical progress with an, an unjustifi unjustifiable sense of moral superiority. That mistakenly coupled their particular mode of mechanical progress with an unjustifiable sense of moral superiority. Just because man need tools is obvious. Man need tools is so obvious. But we must guard ourselves against its overuse. That was Mumford emphasizing. That we must guard ourselves against the overuse of tools. Right from Stone Age, friends, right from Stone Age, hundred thousands of years ago, we have started this habit. Of course, man has certain very important tools or organs. We have certain persistent abilities to explore with our own natural tools. You have organic capabilities such as nose that's a tool nose is a tool eye is a tool 
hands, legs, ears, tongue, lip, sexual organ. These are all tools, natural tools. So the hand, for example, hand. The hand is a specialized working tool. Hand is a specialized working tool. You can use your hand to stroke a lover's body, hold a baby close to your breast, make a significant gesture with your hand. So you can, you know, friends, you can do so many things with, with your, uh, you know, organic tools. These organs of man are specific tools designed by nature with a specific purpose. But the tool techniques that we have acquired is but a fragment of the biotechnics. The biotechnic is man's total equipment of life, biotechnic. That we combine tools with nature, that is biotechnic. But the point is that tool technique has ruined the biotechnic. The tool technique has ruined the biotechnic. And it ruined, the tool technique has ruined. I, I, my point is that tool technique is just a part of the biotechnic. And biotechnic is man's total life. But the dilemma is that tool technique has ruined the biotechnic. And our humanity, our essence, our own nature is robbed off by the tool technique. So we have placed each tool, we have placed each tool against our own nature, our own natural organs. We have placed each tool against our own natural organs one by one. In the end, we are almost, we are almost on the brink of an extinction as a species with energy, soul and emotion. Friends, with this, I'm winding up this lecture. Now the floor is open for discussion. Friends, you can have questions.